don't know, phenomenal is a hard word to live up to, but I'll give it a shot. Um, thank you very much. I'm excited to be here. This is a really great group, and I've enjoyed meeting a lot of you. I met some of you last year when we did the tour at the Boneyard, and I know some of you are planning to be there tomorrow as well, and we'll give you details about that when we finish up. Um, but what I wanted to do today, for those of you that might not know about our museum, is to just kind of give you a general history on who we are and what we're trying to accomplish. And then I've brought some examples of some of the signs that we have in our collection. And I'll catch you up to date on some of the research we have done. And quite frankly, probably some of you in the room can help us with some of the things that we're trying to learn because so many of you are so interested in the history of the old hotels. I started as their first employee about a year and a half ago, and my job was to sort of collect all the records and the archives from different entities that have tried to make this happen. And we're trying now to kind of catch up on, okay, what do we have, where did it come from? So it's an ongoing research process, which is really kind of fun. So I'll go through, I have a, a slide presentation to show you some different things. When we finish that, then I'm happy to answer questions or if you have things you want to offer to me as far as things you might know or things you noticed, then I'm happy to do that. I like a really kind of a casual situation, so don't, don't hesitate to ask questions and that sort of thing. Um, with me today also is Tracy Cardoni sitting up front. And thank God she is another employee that I have now. She works part time and she'll be actually handling the tours tomorrow if you're coming out. So you'll get to um, meet her and she does a phenomenal job with tours. There she is. Hello. <laughs> um, she does a great job. And her background is in arts education. So she and I are busy working on a lot of teacher programming and that sort of thing. So um, she does a little bit of everything as well. Okay, um, just to get started, if I have to say next or Maybe we should have a hand signal for the slides and do that. Okay, next. Um, just to give you a really quick history, um, different groups tried to make this happen for about 20 years. Um, it started with some really passionate individuals that saw signage as a really great representation of Las Vegas history for a lot of reasons, for design elements, for the, the properties that they represent, um, for actual social history, those sorts of things. So you saw different individuals and then some different arts groups tried to make it happen for a while. Um, Young Electric Sign Company, which is one of the largest sign companies, if not the largest sign company in the United States, they have offices all over the West, had a few employees there that really saw the importance of keeping signs. So when a lot of signs were taken down and normally would have been scrapped or thrown out, the sign company had the foresight to keep them. So that was going on. These arts groups were going on. Individual collectors. All of these things were sort of brewing for about 20 years. And the current group that I work for formed a nonprofit organization that worked in conjunction with the city of Las Vegas for a while. And the city gave some staff time to it, gave three acres for us to have a boneyard. And then the nonprofit kind of split away from the city in order to do more fundraising. So that's where we are now. They hired me a year and a half ago so that we could be an independent organization, but we're still very much tied to the city of Las Vegas. They've been really instrumental in making that happen. Um, other things that have gone on, um, as I said, it was a real grassroots effort. When I came on board, there were lots of stories of individuals um, knowing where a sign was and pursuing it heavily. They might go purchase that sign, or somebody might convince somebody to donate a sign, but it, was, it wasn't very organized. It was sort of spread all over the place. So we've brought together a system to do those things. The first idea for, for the signs was to restore them and install them as public art. That was their idea, to get them back out, to bring them back to the way that they used to look and get them out for the public to, to view. So the first signs that they did were installed in 1987. If you've been down to the Fremont Street Experience in that area, the very first sign they did was the horse and rider. Um, and I'll show you some slides of all of those signs that are down on Fremont. But that was the first movement, was to go ahead and, and restore. Um, they were chosen, you like that? <laughs> I'm trying to throw some neon in there where I can, right? Um, a lot of the signs that were first chosen, the first clusters as we call them in these outdoor galleries, were chosen because of local significance. All of the money to, to restore these signs, which is about a quarter of a million dollars for this first group of signs, was all individual donations. Um, the city didn't pay for that. There weren't any grants. These were just passionate individuals and families from Las Vegas that have been here forever that wanted to see it happen. Um, so that's how that happened. They were chosen because they had a local tie and maybe a particular family wanted to see their businesses sign get restored, but also because there were classic design elements through the history of sign design, which I'll point out to you as we go through. 
Um, the first one, like I said, was the Hacienda Horse and Rider. Um, if you've seen that down on Fremont Street, it's right at Fremont and Las Vegas Boulevard. That was their first installation. It was done in 1987. And this sign, of course, stood where Mandalay Bay stands today. So it was very far south on the other end of town. Um, and now it's moved up to be downtown. So that was our first one. We can go on to the next one, Aladdin's Lamp. This is the first Aladdin's Lamp. This one's circa 1966. Um, if you've been to the Boneyard, and I'll show you a picture later, we have a second one that was later that was actually the one that was on the sign when the building was imploded. Um, so we're lucky enough to have two of those examples. This one doesn't have uh, the neon elements, but it's still a fabulous sign. And unfortunately, that base was run into by a car last year. That was part of the job no one really warned me about. <laughs> Hello, your sign just got hit. Uh, but luckily the sign wasn't hurt. And um, it was actually a drunk driver that, that hit, that somehow got through the posts, hit that base. So God bless Yesco for an amazing base that they built. And then he ran into a coffee shop and hit a wall. So uh, luckily nobody was hurt and the sign was okay. Um, Andy Anderson, this is a, a local icon. If you're from Vegas or you've been coming here for a long time, it's Andy Anderson from Anderson Dairy. And you know how every city sort of has that local dairy that everybody knows. Um, they're still active in the community. This sign was from 56, and he was their mascot, and he's still used today. So everybody recognizes him, and they're very active. Um, lots of work with school groups and tours, and they're really supportive of us as well. So we're proud of him being down on Fremont. Um, Chief Hotel Court. This is a great example. This was 1940, and at that time, if you looked at the history of hotels, and especially in the West, this was a very common theme, to use the Old West, the cowboy and Indian kind of motif. Um, you'll see that sort of thing. So this was chosen especially for those design elements. Um, you can't really see it very well, but I, it, I think it says refrigeration on the bottom, or the, maybe that's Nevada Motel. That's the uh, steamed. Yeah, it's fun to see what was important to try to draw a customer in. When we talk about the history of signage, obviously they're all meant for the same purpose, to get you to stop, to get you to come in, to get you to use those services. And so we talk about what mattered to the public at that time. And at the time, this was the cool, trendy thing to see, and that would pull you in off of the street. This is just a beautiful sign, if you've seen this one. It's the Fifth Street Liquor sign from 1946, which was a local liquor store, obviously on Fifth Street. And it is an, and it's a really great, I wish I could have had an animated picture, and I'll, I'll up my technology in the future to make that happen for you. But it moves, and you can see the, the bottle pouring into the glass. And this one is actually inside the structure called Neonopolis. If you've been down there, there's a whole collection of neon in there, but that is the only sign in there that's from Las Vegas, and it's the only one that belongs to the museum. There's a, there's a lot of confusion about that, but we had nothing to do with the rest of that collection. It's a private collection from California. We just did an agreement with the owners to install the Fifth Street Liquor sign in there, and it's really one of the jewels of the collection because of its age and because it was restored just beautifully, and it's a really great example of that animation. Um, the Third Street Gallery, if you've been down there, is right off the canopy if you're under the Fremont Street experience. And it was the second installation. And it, uh, the proposal stands right now to extend that. We were talking about that this morning. We have a historic post office, um, which is one of the few buildings on the historic register in Las Vegas. And that stands at the end of Third Street. And it's going to be turned into a cultural center next year. And so the proposal is to carry this line of signs all the way down that street. So we're working with the city on possibly doing that. But the ones that are there right now, we can show you. Um, the Red Barn, this was from 1960. This was actually a bar that ended up burning down. So it was really uh, in the 80s. So it was really great that the sign was saved. And it was chosen because it has that classic Vegas element of the martini glass. And you'll see that a lot in those signs of that era. And it, um, it stands down on that Third Street Gallery. Um, the next one is the Flame Restaurant. This one's interesting. This is the, the bottom half of the sign, and if you go to the Boneyard, you'll see the top half of the sign tomorrow. So what they did is they just took the bottom part and uh, restored it. Actually, do I have it opposite? No, that is the bottom. Um, they restored it. The Flame Restaurant was a popular local um, place, and this is another great example of animation. Um, Dots Flowers was a local florist, and that was chosen. This one was from 1949, and this is really classic of that time because of the font that was used. And it was chosen because it was another local business that everyone knew. And you can see it says wedding information and corsages. So when gambling um, became legal in the 40s, and at the same time, quickie weddings happened, not you know, were, and quickie divorces, not 
Not a coincidence, I don't think. All those things became legal in the same year. Um, obviously, all of these other businesses built up around it and still feed it today. Wedding chapels, the services for the weddings. In fact, the first early hotels of Las Vegas were built as resorts for people to come and get their residency so then they could have their quick divorce. Um, and so those, a lot of the early resorts were built for that reason. And so we try to find signage that then we can kind of take the sign and expand out and teach some of those other components of our history. This one is really important. This was circa 1950, the Nevada Motel. And if you look on the top, do you recognize that character? That's Vegas Vic. This is the first time he ever appeared. And so that was a very important sign in the history of Las Vegas especially. Um, we've talked with the designer's son, and it turns out Vegas Vic um, has a twin up in Wendover, Wendover Will. And he's actually about to come down. And we're talking about possibly bringing him back to Vegas, although I don't know if the northern folks, I'll tell you more about that relationship um, as we go on. I'm trying to have a peaceful, peaceful summit. Let's put it that way. Uh, but this is a really great one, because that's the first time he showed up. Vegas Vic is still in operation, although his arm doesn't move anymore. He's under the Fremont Street experience. And he doesn't say, howdy, partner. Um, but he's still there. And so he's sort of on our wish list, but at least we have this first representation. Presentation. We also are lucky enough to have the first sketches of him and um, the early pictures of uh, the owner's son when he was about four years old when this was going up. So this is really has a lot of personal ties. Um, a little bit about how we go about collecting signs right now. Um, obviously, with our huge staff, um, <laughs> it's. <laughs> We, we rely on a lot of volunteers. Um, one of the, the biggest volunteer functions that we have are there, there are eyes. There are eyes in the field, really, letting us know when a building is going out of business, when a construction process is happening. Somebody will literally call and say, hey, I drove by the corner of such and such, and there's a wrecking ball. They're getting ready to tear that building down. And literally, we have sort of a salvage scenario where call the troops, find a truck, let's go. we got to save the sign. I mean, it's still very much like that because we're still trying to get the message out, especially to some of these smaller businesses, that we even exist. Um, we've actually missed a couple of signs. One we missed this year by just 30 minutes. Um, it was put in a dumpster, and the trash came. And we literally were there with a truck, and it was gone. 30 minutes, and we missed it. Um, so we're, we're in a desperate need to get the word out that there is a place to take these rather than throwing them away. So we rely on a lot of our volunteers. We are working on approaching a lot of the owners of signs that we would like to see saved. And we're, we're starting what's called a living museum program, where we go to to the owners and say, if this sign is ever going to come down or if you're going to sell your building, we would like first right of refusal on it. Um, we would like to help you preserve it. We're looking at funding to help people take care of these old signs as well. Um, but when we actually um, do some of the background work, I think you heard from David Schwartz last year at this convention, who is in charge of special collections at UNLV. And he and I worked together and hired some grad students and did a whole survey of the strip. We did phase one, which was sunset to Sahara, and surveyed every neon sign in existence. And it's on our website um, if you want to go there and check it out. Um, but that survey is then being extended down to downtown, and then it's going to go to the whole county and then the whole state. So that's step one. But even this survey that we just finished about a year and a half ago is already outdated. Um, because signs come down and get changed so much, but at least it's a beginning. So we're working on that. There's an art student at UNLV that this year photographed every sign on the Strip and downtown. And then the City of Las Vegas Pre Historic Preservation Office also just finished a complete photographic documentation of every sign. So that's really the first step to even know what's out there. And then we're mapping all of it and um, working to try. My partnership with the Reno comes up here, doesn't it? Um, there's a group up in Reno. Luckily, they're museum colleagues of mine. So luckily, it's all starting on a friendly note. But they called me and said, hey, we, you know, we have some signs that are going to be available in Reno. And we'd like to get them installed. How do we go about it? And it looks like we're going to become the umbrella organization for the whole state. Um, I'm going up there actually next week to sit down with them so that we can do the same work and not go for the same donors and the same grant money and duplicate each other's work. So there will end up to be a complete map of the whole state of all neon. And um, a, a, a plan on how we'll collect it and restore it and where it'll end up. So we're really excited about that 
that prospect. It didn't start out that way because there were you know, some old rivalries, but the museum geeks, that's what we call it, you know, stepped in and decided we're going we're gonna to do this for the sake of for the state. And hopefully, we can keep you updated on that, and it'll turn out to be a really great project. Um, now I want to show you, I've brought um, some of the signs. This first section are signs that we've just collected in the last year. Just to give you an idea, I'm just going to outline really quickly what it entails. A lot of you probably know we got the skull from Treasure Island. And that there was some controversy uh, about that. It was really interesting to watch. Some people didn't want to see it come down. Some people didn't like the new image that Treasure Island was creating. And we were just the neutral people in the middle, happy to get the sign. Um, they called and tried to be incognito before the plan and said, we have a very large sign and we're interested in, I mean, they approached us, which was great, that we're interested in donating to the museum and how large, you know, I started to have this conversation and it ended up, well, it's sort of in the shape of a skull. <laughs> <laughs> okay then, let me, let me think really hard what that might be. And, and we have a poster of it actually right over my desk in the office. It was really fun having this conversation, looking right at the picture going, yeah, I think I know what, which one we're talking about. Um, but that was a case where they approached us, which was really great. They understood the, the value in preserving that piece of history. They covered the costs, which were phenomenal to, it it took three days of a crew to prepare it to even come down. Um, then they threw us a big party and of course did fireworks and that's, that's museum curating in Las Vegas. It's very different um, than a lot of other cities. There was a party and a dinner and fireworks and, and, and a crane pulled it down and it had to be on a semi, on a flatbed semi and then Las Vegas Boulevard had to be closed and there was a police escort and they had to drive it down and it was four in the morning when it ended up at the boneyard. I mean, it cost them easily $50,000 to make that happen just to pull it down. Um, and we only got one half of it. Um, the other half, unfortunately, was scrapped because there was nowhere to take it and nobody had the money to do anything. But luckily, we have half of it. And that photo to the right was just taken about two weeks ago. Um, we, have, we work with a lot of photographers. And that was one of the coolest views I ever saw. You can see the sky behind his teeth. Um, and he was sort of on the side of it. It's laying flat. If you go tomorrow, you'll see it. Um, this was another one that came down this year. And just to give you an idea of the work involved, it's not like curating a photograph or a painting. I mean, I need a crane every time something happens. And we don't own our own truck with a crane yet, which is on our wish list. If anybody has one they'd like to donate, talk to me after. Uh, but this was another situation that where we were approached by the owner. It's a young guy who was um, selling it to a chain, a national chain, and so it was no longer going to be this privately owned sign. But he was very excited about the prospect of being part of history and being able to take his kids there and know that he used to own this sign. So this one, we were there at dawn, and it took about eight hours um, to bring it down. This was the city center. Um, we found a whole pigeon colony with about 35 pigeon eggs in it, things we never think about. You know, They were very upset. They were circling us the whole time we were out there. Um, but we ended up with both pieces of it. You can go on to the next one. I think there's one more. Yeah, and there's the bottom of it. And all of it is now in the boneyard as well. So that was another good one that we were able to save because it's just a beautiful piece from the 50s fully functional. Um, the next one was the Tam O'Shanter. If you've been studying Vegas or been here a lot, that was another one that came to us this year. And that was another case where it was the owner's daughter who you know, has lived here forever and wanted to make sure that it was preserved. Um, this property is being um, used by the Venetian. And so this came down um, probably, what, two months, two to three months ago. You can see the, the hat on top of the flatbed as it was being brought in. So it's a huge process. It's an all-day situation whenever one of the big ones comes down. I think there might be one more. OK, um, the Rio Hotel. This is the Voodoo Dollars. This is one of the first interior signs we received. And this was actually donated by the slot machine company. Many times when signs are made, the properties themselves don't buy them. Even their large pylon signs in front, they'll lease them from a sign company because they do wear out or they'll replace them, the ownership varies in every situation. So this was actually owned by the slot company. They took it out of the Rio and called us. This was another one where they called us and said, would you like it? And it's, it's a really cool sign. And you can see, again, they may not look that big when you're in the hotel, but they require the flatbeds and, and large trucks to bring them in. Um, this one is one that we're working on. It's very hard to see. I apologize. I think that actually came from my phone, that picture. Um, <laughs> Because you know, you're out there and you have to grab it. This is called the Harleys Motel. I don't know if anybody's ever seen that. It's over in North Las Vegas. But it's an example of literally probably 100 little 
places around the state that have these really cool, interesting signs that we just stumble on. Um, and this is one where the owner is selling, and it's going to be a strip mall. And we're sort of keeping our eye on it. They don't have the money to help us with the transportation, so we're trying to see if we can make that work. But we're constantly sort of have a list of five or six on the, on the watch list, and this is one of those. Um, now the Boneyard. Once they get there, we have a lot of different um, elements to it. There is a long-term lease. Like I said, the city gave us the land. Um, Yesco has now moved all of their signs. If you followed the sign history, they had a boneyard and people could go visit it at the sign company and they no longer do that. They didn't want to be in the visitor business. And it became so huge, which we have come to experience, that they brought all of their signs to us. So we do have all of Yesco's signs as well. Um, we have about 115 in our collection. And I'll just show you some of the ones we do have. I tried to mix in some historic photos so you can kind of put them in context. That's what we're really working on, is trying to build our files to show where they were. And that's tough with some of them. The landmark is very well known, obviously. Um, that building was inspired by the Seattle Space Needle. And um, that's, that's a picture of the sign when it was working. If you go to the next one, you can see it. That's how it looked in the Boneyard. It's actually on exhibit right now at another museum. So um, unfortunately, you won't see that one at the Boneyard tomorrow. Um, we have one from the dunes. That's the only thing from the dunes we have. Except we have one other small one that just says casino. Um, but this at least shows the classic font that they had and the use of that form. That one's on the, at the State Museum. Um, the next one is Modern Laundry. I didn't have a picture of it in the boneyard, but if you ever were in Las Vegas, this was um, a cleaners, and we have quite a few examples of those. They always seem to have the really great font in the 50s especially, so we were able to get that one as another example of a local business. Um, Motel Domino, deluxe accommodations don't look so deluxe anymore. Um, but this, this is a great example of some of those old, from the old motels, the old hotels, um, and actually a local artist named Jerry Misko has raised funds to restore that one, so that will, will come back. A lot of people get really passionate about individual signs, so that one will be brought back to life. Um, and of course, the Indians, I love this postcard. You know, the world's largest electric sign. I have no idea if that's true when it was made. At, who knows? Um, seven miles of neon and 28,000 bulbs um, for the front of the building. And we are lucky enough to have quite a few examples from Binion's because they underwent quite a few different remodels and sort of changes of the facade. So if we go ahead, we can see a few of the ones. This was a main one. That's a really beautiful piece, all completely intact. And the next one is that repeated H pattern that they still use all over. If you're down on Fremont, you can see that. Um, it's interesting, when you see it in person, you can see on the top how much the top part had faded. And that's, that's probably why they replaced it, when they just start you know, wearing out from the weather. And then this was a great one um, from the casino as well, with the age, with the horseshoe. That's probably my favorite from Binion's, I think. Uh, Las Vegas Club, that's a great old picture of it. And if you go on, this is the piece that we have from it. Another one. This one gets photographed constantly um, because it says Las Vegas Club, and people just love that one. That's one that they're actually, the hotel is looking at restoring. So we're, we're getting a lot of interest, a lot of the, this resurgence of the downtown area. There's some new hotel owners and people really interested in seeing this happen. So we're starting to build good relationships with them. This is the second Aladdin's lamp I told you about. And it's actually, you'll see it different tomorrow. It was boosted up on a platform for the Billboard Music Awards, <laughs> which shot there um, in December. They had the band Evanescence. If you're into pop music, they won Best New Artist of the Year or whatever. And they came and did a live video for the Billboard Music Awards. And their producer had a vision and wanted the signs moved. And we run into that quite a lot. It's like, well, can't we just put that over there? We'll have a crew of four men. Uh, no. Um, just to give you an idea, the lid, the small lid on the top, requires a crane just to take the lid off. Um, so the scale, and I try to, people ask me the weights all the time, and we try to get them when the cranes come to move them because we don't have that data on a lot of them. So there I am with the crane guys going, wait, 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 what is it weigh? You know, they, they really like the weird museum girl. Um, <laughs> somebody's like, I've got to write that down. We've got to know what that weighs. Golden Nugget, of course, is another classic 
um, hotel from downtown. And this is a great, this, some of these historic photos came from the Yesco archives. They've done a great job of pulling together all their old photos. And this is when it was actually being constructed, um, that top part of that sign. You can see just part of the letters are there, which is a great piece. We have quite a few of theirs as well. If we go through, I can show you a couple. Um, we have one of these great facades. There's another one that I don't have a photo of, which you'll see tomorrow, which is a little bit bigger, actually. And then we have quite a few of the letters, which you'll see. Um, showboat, you can look to the left there and see that original sign. And the scale is sometimes hard to understand until you're in front of it. So if you go to the next slide, there's one letter. Yeah. And it's about 30 some odd feet tall. Um, and you'll see that tomorrow. If you're a CSI fan, did anybody happen to see the episode that the Boneyard was in last month? Did anybody see it? Well, that's where the murder was, right there. He was, he was hanging on the posts on the bottom of the W. Um, we never knew his name. He was just called Dead Guy during, during the whole shoot. And Tracy and I would laugh because he'd be over having a cup of coffee with his, you know, his dead makeup and on his cell phone. And Dead Guy, we need you back. And he was, um, he was swooped over the bottom of one of those poles. And you can think about what those poles are for. And Tracy will ask you tomorrow on the tour if you can see those little poles sticking out. That's, she'll, she'll check to see what you think those might be used for. Oh, the suspense. We'll wait till tomorrow. <laughs> Um, Silver Slipper. Um, it, it was great the other night hearing the talk and, and having Claudine Williams here, who actually was one of the owners of the Slipper. And we were talking this morning trying to debunk an urban myth. We hear all the time, and Tracy, I found out an answer. We hear all the time when people come in that Howard Hughes, of course, was living in the desert and across the street from the hotel and was annoyed by this sign. Um, actually, it's the next sign. If you go to the next picture, you see the giant shoe? Well, it rotated and was lit. It was fully lit, bulbs all over it. And the story went that he was annoyed by this sign and therefore decided to buy the hotel so he could get rid of the sign. And we hear that all the time and we never knew. Now, apparently, um, Claudine Williams has a note written um, from Bob, who spoke to us the other night, saying, get rid of the sign and we want to buy the slipper. Um, so apparently, it was true. So I'm very excited to hear that because we weren't sure. Um, you go to the next, sign, the next slide, there's the shoe. Um, and you can see that tomorrow as well. We have three different donors that want to uh, restore this one. And we had a shoe company that wanted to restore it last year. And of course, write their name down the, the, the base of it, you know, on that red part. So we didn't go for that. But there's quite a few people. So we think that one will definitely get restored as we move forward, because it's just a beautiful piece. Coin Castle, does anyone remember, do you remember this place down on Fremont? Um, this is another great example of a family getting involved. It was the daughter of the owner who um, contacted us to find out where it was, and it ended up, it was at the Yesco Boneyard, and they were very excited. This was a small property down on Fremont, um, but they're very interested in knowing that it's there and wanting to work with us. He was um, decapitated. What's interesting, a lot of these signs were never meant to be removed. They weren't designed for a life beyond you know, being installed on a building. So especially with a lot of the older ones, when they go to take them down, they just have to cut them or, you know, break the metal or break the fiberglass. And so we're, we end up with some interesting um, pieces. And his head was actually next to him when I arrived. And we, it looked kind of scary, so we put it back on. <laughs> um, Sassy Sally's. I don't know if you remember that place. These are two great signs. Sassy is right next to it, and that's a very popular photo spot, too, the sassy part. So, um, The Normandy Motel. Anybody been here long enough to remember this place? Um, it was around for almost 50 years. It, it closed, um, actually, I think 2000 when, when, when it finally closed. Um, but if you go to the next site, it, it opened back in the 40s. And the, that you might remember. It, it either said, Elvis slept here or highly recommended by owner on the reader board. The, the owner had quite a great sense of humor. And she, uh, when it finally closed in 2000, um, decided to donate uh, to us. And it's one of the oldest ones in the collection, and it was very well kept. So it's just a beautiful sign. But that's an example where it was broken into three pieces. Um, two of the pieces, if you go to the next slide, there's one piece. Two of the pieces are actually at the State Museum, and the reader board is at, at our place right now. Um, we did an exhibit of about 35 of the older signs to get them out of the dirt, basically, um, over at the State Museum. And we're in the process of moving them to the Children's Museum. So they're protected until we have a place. La Concha. It was actually Tracy who figured out that that's where this was from, because I wasn't sure. It, we just have the MOT. 
and we didn't have any documentation, but if you look very closely, you can see that it looks like the, the shape of a, of a shell. And as we started to look back on some of the other photos and so forth, Tracy kept saying, it looks like Laconcha, and sure enough, it turns out that it was. That's a great property um, right down here by the pepper mill. We have already been promised the sign the big red sign by Las Vegas Boulevard. And interestingly, we've been approached about actually getting the building, the lobby. And um, the owners have expressed interest in doing that. And the Historic Preservation um, Commission is looking at whether it's stable enough or sturdy enough to be moved. If it can be moved and can be adopted, then we'll adopt it into our plan. I would love for that to be part of our visitor center because it's such, a, such an important building. Dockinettis. This was one we didn't know where it was from for a long time. It was a debate that a bar, like five different bar names, and were being tossed out. And finally, we found out where it was from. He's one of the most interesting. He doesn't have any neon on him, and I'm not sure if he ever did. Um, but he's steel, and if you get to see him up close, the workmanship on it is just great. Apparently, there were three of these made by a Montana artist, and one of them ended up here in Las Vegas. There's a close-up of his face and the clouds. This is one of my favorite pictures. He does kind of, huh? And he has a Hawaiian shirt on for whatever reason. Uh, Lady Luck. We have a few from the Lady Luck. This is over in the old boneyard. El Cortez, another downtown property that's interested in restoring, actually. They've come over to see it. This one, I, I flipped it so you could read it. The El Portal, which was a historic theater down on Fremont Street, um, very popular back in the 40s and 50s. And they still actually have one of the original signs on there, although now it's, in, it's a souvenir shop. Indian souvenirs, I think, is what it's called. Um, but if you look closely, you can still see an El Portal sign. And right behind it, you can see a woman waving at you. <laughs> um, she's the only sign that is not from Vegas. She's from Utah. And that was from a Chinese restaurant. What city was it? Cedar? Cedar City? We had a visitor come through who recognized her from his hometown and sent us pictures of her on the building, which was very cool because we, we didn't know where she was from. Stardust, of course. Um, Stardust signage is perhaps some of the most well-known um, because of that distinctive font and because they really utilized the theme of the day when the space race was in full swing and the atomic era, you know, the atomic bars, atomic drinks, they really carried that theme all the way through. When showing a mushroom cloud was a tourism draw, um, that this was... <laughs> And they're all over. You've probably seen those ads. Um, this Stardust was just phenomenal. We have the original rendering for the sign on the left, um, which is just gorgeous. And it's just a great piece for our archives. Um, that's another interesting part to start seeing how the process, getting the drawings, meeting the artists. Um, but if you come to the next slide, here's one of the letters. Um, we have two sets. One set from the 60s and another one from a little bit later. One was from the facade on the front and one from the side, I believe. And you'll see two sets of those. And the Stardust people have actually also been over because they've been trying to go a little more retro and wanted to look at the old signs and look at the old font and see if they might want to think about redoing it. Sahara. We're lucky enough to have a set of those letters from the Sahara, they were generous enough to donate money to restore one of them that's on exhibit. But it was, just to give you an idea, it was $3,500 to restore one half. Um, so it's a very pricey enterprise um, to restore these signs. Many of them from the 50s, you have to update all of the electricity, obviously, and the wiring, and then some of the, even some of the bulbs have to be changed and so forth. Also, the H and the R is over the hard rock. Yeah, and I, the H and the R, he, it was a great point, is over at the Hard Rock. And I don't know how they ended up there. I think that happened when it was still sort of spread all over, and they probably talked to the ESCO, is my guess. But they're really more protected there. I just want to get over there and let them know if they ever come down, they, they have to come to us. So. Royal Nevada, I don't know if you're familiar with that. It wasn't open for very long. I think we've figured out maybe five years. First we thought 18 months, and a lot, there's a lot of conflicting data on hotels and how long they lived. <laughs> um, but this one was a beautiful crown, and it said Royal Nevada in those letters, and great photos, you know, the 50s bathing beauties and everything all around it. Um, seen better days, but it is probably one of the most favorite pieces for photographers. They love all the rust and the colors and the textures, so they, they look at that one a lot. 
And then we have a few other examples. Um, obviously, the, you know, the typical bar. Um, to, the, to the right there, it says Lone Palm. I don't know if you can actually read that, but that used to stand where New York, New York stands now. So back when the, the landscape was very different, you'd be driving in from LA and you'd see the Hacienda and then the Lone Palm, very different. What has happened is now the buildings are really signage. And that's when we talk about architecture and the history, it's gone from sort of a nondescript building with a sign pulling you in. Now the signs are almost nondescript because they're all pretty flat with the screens, but at the buildings are actually the signage. So that's a whole new way of looking at signage. I don't know how we're going to collect buildings in the future, but that's how we talk about it anyway. Um, different examples, I have a few slides in here. Some of the things we're going through, when we see some of these great pictures, it's like, whatever happened to that sign? And we're finding sometimes it'll be the, the crew that took it down. If it was a lease sign that was just going to get scrapped, somebody will say, oh, I have a piece of that in my backyard. I have a piece of that in my garage. Um, sometimes a designer might end up with it again. Um, sometimes they were scrapped. Sometimes they were sold. Some we have found out are living in other countries at different buildings. You know, it's just amazing to start to track what happened or some were destroyed or you know people will just say whatever happened to the whatever and we have to go back now and try to piece that history together and it's really tough in a city that is constantly changing but we'll just um, show you a few pieces I love this apparently it was called the fortune bar and I would love to have that slot machine but that's a, that's an example you have it fortune club, fortune club sorry can we just you want to edit that for me <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that's another one where I, don't, I just run across a picture and I have no clue, but I would love to have it. So we, we have to start sort of doing a wish list of research. Thank you. I knew you'd help me. Um, Fremont, I don't, you know, they're, they're still around and they still have some of that great um, neon and some of that signage. And it's something that we need to talk to them again and say, if this comes down, it needs to end up with us. Thunderbird, I wish we had those. And I've been asked many times where they are, and I don't know. And that's, that's an ongoing piece of research. I have a feeling they're somewhere. I can't imagine that they were scrapped, but you never know. Um, but just so you kind of know, those are some of the questions we have and the pieces that we're looking for. Sands, people ask all the time about sands, and we don't have um, a large piece from it. We have a small one that doesn't even say sands. It says casino or something like that. Um, but I don't know what happened to those letters. If you do, please tell me. Um, Trop, we ran into this fountain picture, um, and I have a feeling that was probably just scrapped, and what a beautiful piece that would, that would be, but we don't know. Again, these are pieces that um, we can only go back to these historic photos and hopefully um, tap the memories of people to find out. I love this. I just threw this in because if you can read it, now under construction is when this hotel was being built. And if you look closely at all their hands, they're holding up nine um, because it was nine stories and that was the tallest high rise in the city when it was being built. And I used to work for the Liberace folks and, and he was their first headliner um, at that time and it was really seen as the spot because it was, you know, the high rise, the place with the biggest headliner, paying the most amount of money any, any entertainer had ever been paid. So you're sitting on a piece of history right now, obviously. And the signage here is phenomenal. Um, the, the front panel, the facade that was redone, um, the current signage, there's a lot there that hopefully we'll be able to have preserved. Caesars, I love this old picture for the gala opening. And we were lucky enough, I don't have a photo of it, but if you go tomorrow you'll see, we received two pieces that weigh about 16,000 pounds. I made the crane guy tell me. Um, when they took down the sign for the new Celine Dion sign, they, they did the new screen and all of the new work, um, we were able to get the old sign from Las Vegas Boulevard. That's another one I forgot to tell you about. But that's over in the Boneyard as well. And again, that was a situation where they called us, which was great. And they understand the historic value. They're very aware of that preservation aspect. So they're sitting over in the Boneyard. And that was interesting. I got to see that new sign being made. And some of the things we talk about is that on the top where it's gold, if you happen to drive by there, you might think they spray painted or, you know, it doesn't really matter, it's not going to be seen, but that's all. I saw a guy, literally his job was to be on top of a ladder with gold leaf, hand applying gold leaf. So it's still, the, the sign industry is still very much um, an art. Um, every piece of neon is blown by hand. Well, the, the glass is blown, but they're still created by hand. Um, the hand gold leafing, and, and it's the sort of trade that people are very passionate about. It's been interesting to learn that. 
Um, the Boneyard today, um, we do guided tours, but we've done so many media shoots. The, the interest in this Boneyard is phenomenal. We've done over 100 shoots in the last year. Every, I just listed some of the various things where you'll just see it crop up either as a prominent feature and we're being interviewed or it's just some weird background. But if you keep your eye open, whenever you see the old signs in the desert, that's us. And we work those shoots. Last week we had one from 5 p.m. to 6 a.m. with a crew of about 50 and they'll block off all of the roads. And this was an Italian feature film. I don't know how many of us are going to see it. A comedy with three Ferraris and a road trip and people running in and having an argument in the boneyard. But it's it's very interesting to see the, the variety. Uh, you know, we have music videos of every kind from country to rap to you know pop music uh, catalog shoots athletes everything it's it's what's what's great for us and encouraging for us is that the interest level runs all ages uh, it's just this interesting fascination um, and then another thing that we do is we work with a lot of artists. And this is, you know, if you're really into the history, that's one thing. But there's this whole next level that we're finding and learning to do exhibitions with where photographers will come in and just start doing these amazing photographs. That sky um, was just, you know, pulling out the letters from one sign, which is a drive-in sign, an old drive-in sign. Um, and then these other two to the left is when you look very closely, it looks like paint and it's you know, the, the weathered effect. So there's a whole next level of not just talking about the signs for what they are, but looking at them as pieces of art, which is another generation. Then we have these photographs to exhibit. So we're having a lot of fun discovering all the different eyes and how they look at it. And there's a couple more examples. Terry um, just pulling out, again, a piece of an A and, and some of the neon. Um, but it's, it's a really fun way to look at it. Um, Craig Kilgore, uh, we have a lot of grad students that come through doing their thesis either in fine art or architecture or history and they come and photograph. So he was another one who, who kind of, I love the bottom middle one, he just pulled out Sin out of Casino. And you know, they'll come in and do a lot of, we have a lady in Chicago who just finished an alphabet book for us. And not really a standard alphabet book, but sort of weird dimensions of the letters, um, but that'll be published and that's gonna be really great. And then just some more examples. Up on the top is a wedding chapel sign, a sweetheart wedding chapel, and then that's a piece of the Sahara underneath. But if you're looking at it from an artistic viewpoint, it's a really cool abstract. Another one. And then this is another uh, artist, Lara Domala. We did a show in one of the city buildings of about five of these photographers this year called it Images from the Boneyard. Um, so it was more of a fine art exhibition, but it was all of these historic signs. So it's fun, and we've worked with a lot of kids and fourth graders and teaching them what's abstract, what's real. Um, then you can also teach history, science. So there's a lot of just, you can go in a million ways with this collection, it's really fun. Uh, if you see, there's the city center that I told you ended up in the Boneyard. And if you look closely, that's a bunch of little girls that are gymnasts. And that just gives you another, they wanted their team photo in the Boneyard. So they brought in about 100 little girls. Some of them were dressed like Elvis. Um, it was really cute. And it's just, you know, all. what's really great is you're seeing this new generation of kids that were born here taking this place as pieces of their history. So they're coming in and seeing this place as their history. And they might walk in saying, oh, is this a junkyard? But they walk out after Tracy and I were done with them, you know, <laughs> preaching preservation and, and why it's important to you take care of the place where you live. And so it's really fun. We get a little bit of everything in there, from stars to the little stars. Um, Girl Scouts, I love this shot. Uh, we have a lot of scout troops that come through to do their, you know, their community preservation badges or their history badges um, or even art and photography badges. So that was a couple, they were just there last week actually. And then as I said, we're doing our guided tours by appointment. We're not open to the public yet. That's another long story. Um, we do neon bus tours. We've started to do for groups at night um, where we go up and down the strip, down downtown, and narrate a lot of the themes about how the architecture has changed and how the signage has changed. So we're experimenting with that. That's a lot of fun. Again, lots of research with a lot of students in the archives, um, archive development, and then these exhibitions. And I just have some really quick shots of some of the exhibits. This is the one over at the State Museum to kind of show you how you can use these as museum pieces as well as these pieces sticking out in the boneyard. Um, but we're teaching a lot about symbolism. You know, why do you know that represents a dollar if there's no word that says that? You, know, you can get into a lot of things. And we, the, the designers did a great job. They put the chain link fence up just to make, make you feel like you were at the boneyard, even though you weren't. Um, that R to the left is, uh, looks like it is from the Riviera, but it's from the Desert Inn. 
And then those are some of the letters that you saw from the golden nugget, and we were able to get a couple of those to light, which is great. And then again, you can kind of see one way of doing an exhibition of making that feeling of the boneyard. And again, some of those that you saw in the boneyard, now you can see how they can end up in a museum and still retain a cool look. A couple more. There's the Sahara letter. Unfortunately, it's not the photo of the side that's lit up. The other side is lit. Sorry about that. But it is a beautiful blue neon. Um, that's what's interesting. When you get these tubes, you don't know what color it is until you plug it in. And the future, yes, we are under construction. Um, we have gone through uh, some different designs. The city council has approved a, a plan to have a visitor center on our site where you'll be tomorrow. We also luckily applied with the city and received four and a half million dollars in BLM money, which is fabulous, which is gonna be, poor, it's specifically for a neon park, which will be part of our site. Um, and so that will be happening. We are, Working on the Living Museum project that I told you about, going out statewide to secure some of these pieces. Um, urban trails all over the valley have been funded and will be connected to a lot of the other cultural institutions. And then the cultural corridor, if you go down to the Boneyard, the whole area of that, the north end of Las Vegas Boulevard, there's about five or six museums as well as an arts district. We're all working together. We're at every city council meeting, um, getting zoning changes, lighting changes, landscaping money, all sorts of things to, to really draw people down to that part of town and to create a real cultural district. So we're, we feel it's our responsibility to be part of that. And I think I gave you here, just to, just to give you an idea of sort of the big plan, the big dream. Might work, might not. I tried it last night. Drum roll. <laughs> We've had a few versions of the sketch, and we're probably going to open. I guess it's not going to work. Oh, there it is. Well, there's one more that sort of gives you a bird's eye view of the whole site. If not, it's on our website. Um, but it, basically, the idea is to create phase one is to have a real simplified visitor center where at least you can come in, you know. That, that's one sketch. That's not, that's not the PDF, unfortunately. But that was one sketch. And again, back to the idea of architecture, is we want our building to be really nondescript. And we want the signage to speak. So it'll be, it'll be an experience where the signage and the boneyard um, are going to be what you come to see. And so we're having a lot of fun trying to design something that still looks like they were sort of left there, but that you can still learn and, and have it be accessible. So we're working on those designs. Um, this is the current site. When you go down there tomorrow, you're, it's beautiful. <laughs> Don't be afraid. Um, uh, actually, those banners that you see line the whole street and designate the cultural corridor. So there's some city money going towards. It may not look like much, but there's a lot happening behind the scenes to this development. And it's sort of the thing where all of it will finally emerge in a couple of years, and you'll see it all. Um, I don't know what else I threw on here on the very end. That was just a little brochure for our free days. We're trying to draw the people downtown to kind of show that there is, yes, arts and culture are indeed alive in Las Vegas. That's the end of my... Thank you. I think we, I don't know how much time we have left, probably. We have about half hour, so that was good. Right timing. Yes, sir. Two questions. Uh -huh. Was, in fact, neon developed in France, and what is your earliest piece of neon that you found here? Yes, neon signage was absolutely developed in France. Neon, I didn't go into the science part of it, but it is a gas. And what was the year? Do you remember, Trace? 1910 was the first sign. It was the first time it was a first developed it, 1910. And it was, it was in Paris that the first time that they put it into a sign, the first US sign wasn't until about 10, 15 years later, and it was in Los Angeles. The tall, slim cowboy you see throughout the state. Uh -huh. Who designed that, and where was the first one? The first, that's the Vegas Vic that I showed you. That was on the Nevada Motel, up on the top of it. So that was the first time he appeared. Um, the guy that's waving, Vegas Vic. And the designer's last name just left my mind. Starts with an E. I think it's something like Anger. Um, and we've talked with his son, but that's the first time it appeared in Nevada Motel, and Yesco created it. Yes. Right here. You mentioned on the slideshow uh -huh. the sign that was from Utah. Yes. 
How did it get to Nevada? It was in Salt, um, Yesco's headquarters are in Salt Lake City, so they have a very large boneyard there. And it was in the boneyard there, and they didn't have room for it anymore. So she got moved to Nevada. By the way, this couple in the front, this lovely couple in front, is another pair who came and did an interesting shot. They did a tour with Tracy and came and did their Christmas card, and they're not alone. Um, people come and pose in front of the signs for their Christmas cards, so thank you. Are you uh, <laughs> interested in getting uh, casino signs and or things from, say, other parts of the country? Just picking a thing out of the I personally would love it if we ended up sort of being a repository, repository for neon period. Yes, personally, I would love to see that. Right now, it boils down to literally money and space. Um, we only have three acres right now, and we really could use six. Um, you know, when these signs come in without warning, that's the other problem. We can't really design a, a time for our collection policy or have an orchestrated way to collect because we don't know ahead of time many times. So I would love to if it came down to having enough room and enough money. Right now there's a museum of neon art in Los Angeles that focuses on art and they've done a little bit of signage but whenever they get a call about signage they push it to us. So I'd love to see that happen. Right now we're going to focus on Nevada. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you.